We're going to continue our study of the confession tonight. Joel did a wonderful job last night, or last Wednesday, leading us in the beginning of chapter 2 of the confession, the first paragraph. And what I want to do is not what I originally planned to do, but as I was hearing him go through that, it's so rich. I want to go back through and I want to highlight and dig just a little deeper than Tom would allow last week on many of the attributes of God in the first paragraph. And then we'll continue to move and we'll look at the second and third paragraph and we will study something about the Holy Trinity. And we'll spend a few weeks doing that. At Oxford University, R.C. Sproul says that there is a gigantic painting of a man and also a small boy by the seaside. This painting is based on a story about the great church father, Augustine, or Augustine, who was the Bishop of Hippo, and he was very famous for many things, one of the greatest intellectual giants of the Christian faith outside the Apostle Paul in Scripture. But what he is really well known for is his book on the Trinity. <laughs> I've read it, and it is uh, it, it is something else, I'll tell you that. Well, as the story goes, it's told that Augustine was walking along the coast by the sea one day, and he met a small boy, and that boy was pouring water from the sea into a hole in the ground. Augustine watched him for quite some time, and eventually Augustine stopped, and he approached the boy, and he asked the little boy what he was doing well, the little boy responded by saying, quote, I am pouring the Mediterranean Sea into this hole. Immediately, Augustine barked back, don't be so stupid, boy. You are wasting your time. You cannot fit the entire Mediterranean Sea into that little hole. And so are you, the boy shot back, trying to write a book about God. And it turns out that that boy might have been more wise than the infinite, infinitely so called wise Augustine. But we understand as we smile here in that story because we understand something of the reticence and the humility as we begin to talk about the attributes of God and the Holy Trinity and how essential the Godhead is, but how completely unable we are to comprehend really who God is. As Augustine said, we say three persons not in order to say something, but in order not to be silent in the face of such mystery. Sproul also said, quote, we should never consider the character of God to be too deep to think about. The more we reflect on his greatness, the more our souls are moved to adore him and worship him for his magnificence. Well, here goes nothing. Let's give it a shot to look at the attributes of God. And let's begin to stretch our minds a little bit. And I want to begin by asking you just a couple questions, but this is a small and personal enough crowd that maybe we could talk to one another, right? Let's just begin with a very simple question. Can God do anything? Can God do anything? Can God do anything? Of course, he's God, right? So let me follow up with this question. Can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? Can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? We're Baptists. Why don't we vote? If you vote yes, raise your hand. God can make a rock so big that he can't pick it up, which means he can't do something. <laughs> How many of you vote no? God cannot make a rock so big that he can't pick it up. Here's another question. Can God make round triangles? Can God make round triangles? God's ways are infinitely beyond our ways. But the truth is, can God do anything? Well, not in that sense of the word. No. Here's what God can do, as the old catechism says. God can do all his holy will. There are many things that God can't do. God can't lie. God cannot cease to exist and die. But what about this question? Is God everywhere? 
Have you ever laid awake at night in the bed and begun to consider things like this? God is eternal. But what does that even mean? And can you begin to wrap your head around that? We can't even think in categories like this. There's a danger in what we're about to do because we ought to study God, but in studying the doctrine of God, we have to remember that God is not a creature and he is not to be examined and dissected. No, God's word examines and dissects us. So we have to approach this subject with the utmost humility when we realize that we're studying the first, the greatest, and the chief of all beings who exist by himself and for himself, and he is beyond our ability to fully understand. But even though we can't fully understand God, we can truly understand God because he's revealed himself to us in his word, which is what we've already seen in the first chapter of our confession Look with me in the confession, and I've done it again. I misplaced my copy. Uh, Justin, would you mind running me a copy? We're going to look at the first paragraph. Here you go. And then we'll walk through just a little by little, and we'll camp out on these attributes and try to drill down a little bit more. It says, the Lord our God is one, the only living and true God. He is self-existent and infinite in being and perfection. His essence cannot be understood by anyone but him. He is a perfectly pure spirit. He is invisible and has no body, parts, or changeable emotions. He alone has immortality, dwelling in light that no one can approach. He is unchangeable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, in every way infinite, absolutely holy, perfectly wise, wholly free, completely absolute. How about that for a job description? He works all things according to the counsel of his unchangeable and completely righteous will for his own glory. This is the resume of all resumes. He is most loving, gracious, merciful, and patient. He overflows with goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. He rewards those who seek him diligently. At the same time, he is perfectly just and terrifying in his judgments. He hates all sin and will certainly not clear the guilty. This is exactly what scripture teaches us. If you would like to turn there, you can, or you can just listen. In Job chapter 38, we come to one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible. Job has been drilling God with questions, and Job has been trying to figure out the mind of God, and God has been silent. And in Job 38, verses 2 through 4, we get some of the most striking verses in the entire Bible. Imagine God comes to you and says, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Talk about being on the hot seat. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding And Job, after God went through, tell me, tell me, tell me, who, 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 decided, you know what? I think I'm going to sit down and zip it (laughs) because I don't know anything. In Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, we read, Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? What is his son's name? Surely you know. Don't you love the sarcasm and satire dripping from the Bible? Isaiah 44 6 through 8 reads, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. 
Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let him declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it, and you are my witness? Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. You think you can figure me out, big boy? Give it a shot. What about Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and following? Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? You walk away from the study of God with more questions than answers. Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. And the church said amen. amen. And then finally, 2 Corinthians 13, 14 shows us the Trinity, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, and the love of God, which is the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <laughs> and we need him to be to study this subject. If you'll look with me in the first paragraph of the confession, we begin, before we really get into the heart of the attributes of God, with a statement about God's self-existence and his self-knowledge. What we are studying is called theology proper. Now, in the realm of theology, we're just simply talking about the study of God. But as you'll see through the confession... There are sub-branches within theology. There is Christology, which is the study of Jesus Christ. There's pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. There's soteriology, which is the study of salvation. And all of these riches we're going to plunder and we're going to look through. But the study of God is properly entitled by this phrase, theology proper. And so we begin with the statement in the first sentence or two, about the self-existence and the self-knowledge of God, that there is only one God and that there is no other. I was reading recently in the Bible where Israel was at war against another nation, and Israel beat them. And so they beat them in the woods. And so they come back the next season, and they said, well, he must be a God of the woods. Let's take him to task on the plains because they don't have a God who rules over the plain, so we'll beat him there. And they cremated him. Because he's the God of the woods and the plains, and he's the God of every nation, and there is no other God. It's not just that there's not any other God like Jehovah. The truth is, there is no God but Jehovah. And so the confession says that he is a personal living being. He's not distant and he's not abstract. He is life-giving. And the problem Romans 1 teaches us is that we exchange the truth of God for a lie. We serve the creature rather than the creator. But what the confession is doing is exactly what Scripture is doing, which is beginning by giving us categories to distinguish between the creature and the creator. The creature and the creator. Theologian Anselm said that God is the most perfect being. And so then we move after the first opening sentences, to the attributes of God. And so we'll go back, we'll drill down on these as much as time will allow us to. And then I have at least five to seven scripture references for each one, but there's no way we could go through those because we would, we would never make this journey. The confession says, and we looked at this last week, is that he is a most pure spirit. So the first attribute of God... By the way, I told a few of the kids, and I want all of you to know that I am going to give you a mission. So the Scroggins kids, Schaefer's, Dawson's, your mission is I want you to tell me after the message two to three attributes of God. An attribute is just simply a characteristic of what God's like. I want at least two to three. I'm going to give you about 15, so I think you can handle two to three. You got it, Abigail? You ready? You ready? No candy, if not. The first one is invisible. 
It means that God is not material and he doesn't have material properties. It's been defined this way. God exists as a being that's not made of any matter, has no parts or dimensions, is unable to be perceived by our bodily senses, but God still shows himself to us through visible and created things. If you've learned your catechisms, you know that God is a spirit and he does not have a body like men. And so we see this in John 4, 24. But God being immaterial often reveals himself in nature in immaterial ways. He's spiritual and he is invisible. We see in 1 John that how can you love God whom you have not seen? Uh, how can you love your brother who you have seen if you've not loved God whom you have seen? Look with me in 1 Timothy 1, which is an awesome passage that really just brags on God because he can't be boasted on enough. 1 Timothy 1, 7, 16 says, but I, or actually verse 17 says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, Amen. If you flip over to chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and what? Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Amen. So God is invisible. Next, we see in the confession another attribute of God. And as Joel mentioned last week, I want to talk more about this one because it's so difficult to wrap our heads around. But this is a, uh, this is a real brain twister. God is without body, parts, or passions. It means that he is without changeable emotions. Now, there have been entire books and volumes wrote on what I'm fixing to try to summarize in about 30 seconds. But first of all, God is without parts. Take a mousetrap. Take a mousetrap. How many parts are involved in a mousetrap? Not the sticky pads. That's only one. The old wooden ones, okay? Don't be a smart aleck. Not many parts. If you take any of those parts away from the mousetrap, do you have a mousetrap? Not one that works. Because a mousetrap is composed of parts that make up a whole. God is not composed of parts in that sense. This is the doctrine of divine simplicity. It means that God cannot be divided up like a man. God is who he is eternally as one whole. But also... If that were not difficult enough to begin to wrap our heads around all the implications of, the next one, and we'll spend a little bit more time up on this one because I think it's important and it's also not talked about much and it's very difficult to understand. So that's why we're here on a Wednesday night. God is without passions. God is without passions or changeable emotions. There's a huge debate, not only whether or not this is true, but there's a huge debate over what this actually means. But I want you to follow with me. If you look at older translations in the Bible, the word passions, it's almost always used in a negative sense. Don't follow the passions of your carnal flesh, sinful pleasures. One theologian explains, though, that at the time of the confession in 1689, they did not have the word that we have emotion. Emotion, And so they would have used other words. We use the word emotion as a catch-all to explain all sorts of human feelings that we have. But the words that they had in their artillery were affections and passions. Affections and passions. Now for them, an, aff an affection is a positive emotion. So an affection is something that originates within a person. God has affections. God is not some distic, deistic force that's cold. Uh, God has joy. He is joy. He is love. He is peace. He is contentment. But a passion, on the other hand, 
as used in the 17th century is negative. It's a form of suffering. And it's something that's experienced that doesn't originate within the person. So passions would indicate, indicate a loss or a decline from someone's natural disposition of who they are. It would include a loss of power, a detraction, or a loss of self-control. It would mean that someone is dependent upon something else acting on them in order to give a response, a response to an outward stimulus. Again, R.C. Sproul basically put it this way, God does not have mood swings and he is not subject to human passions. See, the gods of the heathens and the pagans can wake up on one side of the bed one day and then on the next day they can be furious and wake up on the other side of the bed. You're like that and I am, aren't I? We can wake up on one side of the bed on Monday morning and you can see one side and we can wake up on another side of the bed on Friday morning and you can see a different side. But God is not like that. God is who he eternally is. He experiences no loss and he is not dependent upon a response to an outward stimuli. There is nothing outside of God that causes a response in that sense. And here's why. God is immutable. God never changes. Do you not take great comfort in that? God never wakes up on the wrong side of the bed. He never wakes up. <laughs> but he's not some erratic, emotionally unstable creature. He's simple and not dependent on parts. Now, God's love is not a passion in this sense. It's not a response to something outside of him in the same sense in which I'm speaking. It is eternally within God, not arising from outside of God. Even God's wrath is an expression of his eternal holiness. So God never changes. Now, we see things like this in the scriptures where it makes us think that he does. Have you ever read passages where it would say things like, God changed his mind. God changed his mind. There's a couple verses that say that. But let me ask you a question. Does God change his mind? I thought we said that God never changes. Calvin calls this lisping. You, anyone ever have children, babies in their life? Ever been around babies? You ever relate to a baby differently than you do an adult. What you do is you stoop and you lower yourself and you use different language to accommodate their capability. So when the Bible speaks of God having an arm that is not too short to save, it doesn't literally mean that he has a flesh and blood arm. He's trying to accommodate our limited understanding. When translations of the Bible say that God repented or he changed his mind, he's not in heaven playing Russian roulette thinking, I think I will, but now I see what's going on down there. Huh, I think I won't. <laughs> it's a form, it's an anthropomorphism. It's a way of God accommodating himself to us in his speech, but God truly and eternally is who he is. He's not like pagan conceptions of God. God, however, though, is a fountain of affection. And his affections flow eternally within from who he is. And they don't change. Look with me at James 1.17. James 1.17. We could talk about this all night and nuance it to death. It's very complicated, but I just want to make a simple point. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. There is none of this business that he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Let's keep going. Next is another attribute of God, and that is his immortality. God's immortality. Boy, when we're young, we think we're immortal, don't we? Get in a car and do 95 miles an hour down the interstate because you think you're going to live forever, don't you? <laughs> we're not immortal. 
This speaks of God's self-existence. The proper theological term for this is God's aseity. His aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. God's aseity. It means that God has the power of existence in and of himself, and he is, abs- he is dependent upon no one for any of his existence or source of life, which is why he revealed himself to Moses when Moses said, Who are you and what will I say? And he said, I am who I am. I eternally exist within myself. I am the source of my own life and I am dependent upon no other for my existence. The rest of creation is completely dependent upon God for their existence. The professing atheist who curses God and then goes on to deny his existence only has the breath to do so because he is dependent upon God for the contraction of his lungs for every syllable that he produces. God is the uncaused cause who exists by the necessity of his own being. So here's where we can get in a little hot water. Do you know who asked the greatest questions in the world? Who asked the greatest questions in the world? It's not the theologians. They typically overcomplicate things. Children ask the greatest questions in the world. I'm telling you to this day, I have kids ask me questions all the time, and I just simply have to go, I don't know. I don't know the answer because I've never actually thought about the question. It's a good question. Children really test your theology. You might ask a child, who made you? Well, if they're at RBC, they know their catechisms. They know the answer to that one. What is it? Who made you? God made me. But then if you're talking to a child who's a typical child, you know what's coming next. And what is coming next? But who made God? And as tempting as it is to say, well, God made God. Boy, you end up in hot water real quick saying things like that. Because God is self-existent and he does not make himself. He always is, was, has been, and will be. It is impossible for something to create itself. There had to be something that always was from which everything else comes. It's Christ or chaos. There's only two explanations for the world. One famous argument in apologetics teaches us that unless something exists in itself, nothing would exist at all. So the idea of a self-existent being is not only possible, it's absolutely necessary. Something had to have always been. Or you're going to play this game and just keep kicking the can down the road. Well, well, who, who, who made the, the, the Bible? Or who put the Bible together? The factory worker put the le- leather and the pages together. Well, who made the factory worker? Well, he come from his mother and father. Who made his mother and father? Well, eventually you get to God. And eventually you kick the can down far enough the road to where you just have to say God or something always was. And obviously that was God. In the book of Psalms, we see this over and over and over. If you'd like to turn with me, you can. If not, listen. In Psalms 50, we see this attribute of God. In Psalm 50... (laughs) verse 10 through 12 you see the satire the sarcasm for every beast of the forest is mine the cattle on a thousand hills I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine listen if I were hungry I would not tell you for the world and all its fullness are mine if I were hungry I wouldn't tell you because I don't need you to know (laughs) it all belongs to me Psalm 90 is one of my favorite psalms. I've preached through this psalm and many others. And in Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Wrap your mind around that. He always was. He always is and he always will be. 
He exists within himself. I heard one pastor describe it this way. Think of it this way. Think about the need to gather water, and you have two options. The first option is that you can put together a bucket brigade. The bucket brigade grabs their buckets, and they go up to the stream, and they grab water, they take it, and then they take it back down. But that bucket is dependent upon that stream. But what if you just were a mountain stream in and of itself? You were always full and always giving out of the overflow of who you are and absolutely dependent on no other source. What if you had two kings and one king taxes his servants to fill his pockets and enslaves them? But you have another king that needs no money for his pockets. He has everything and he serves his people out of the overflow of who he is in need of nothing in return. We're indebted to God, but we cannot ever pay back God. (laughs) There's no way that can ever be our motive. Let's continue going. Next, God is immutable. And we've already looked at this one. It means that God is unchanging. God is immutable, means he's unchanging in his being, perfections, purposes, and promises. And so God may change how he treats people, but there's no change in God, which comes back to Numbers 23, 19 and Jonah chapter 3 with the references of God changing his mind. Well, God changes how he treats people, but there's not a change within the Godhead itself. Another attribute of God, not only immutable, but here's another one, immense. God is immense, which means he is without limits and he is without boundaries. This is one of the hardest ones for me to wrap my head around. Because we live our entire existence with limits and boundaries. How many of you know that with your physical body, you cannot do the things that you used to do? You have limits and you have boundaries. How many of you have realized that there is only 24 hours in a day and that's all you get? You are confined to that limit and you only get one life and you only get one body and one mind and we all have different various limits, but the Bible says God knows our frame. We each have a certain frame. And so we're always operating in the confines of limits, whether it's physically or whether it's time. And you know what happens when you try to act outside those limits? You realize real quick that you're not God. And if you keep trying to play God, you're going to break down. Your body's going to break down. You're going to have a nervous and emotional breakdown. You are trying to operate outside the limits that God has created you for. And you're trying to play a dangerous game called being God. But God is without limits, and he is without boundaries and spatial dimensions, but he is present at every point of space with his entire being. Which leads us to another attribute of God, and that is this, that God is omnipresent. Immensity means that all of God is present everywhere. Omnipresence means that God fills all reality. I mean, this is otherworldly thinking, is it not? This is a completely different dimension than we're used to thinking on. God is omnipresent. What this doesn't mean is that God spreads himself out over the whole world. So so, so Korea gets a little bit of God, and Peru gets a little bit of God, and America gets a little bit of God, although they're wanting to give up the little bit they have left. And everybody gets a little bit of God. But that's not what this means. This means that God is everywhere present in all of his fullness. God knows everything. I love how Joel put it next week. You can turn the lights off, but God sees as if it were full noonday. You can't hide from God. You can run, but you can't hide. The next attribute of God is his eternality. He is eternal, backwards and forwards and everything in between. Elevated above all temporal limits. He is above a succession of time. I can't comprehend this. How many of you are time-oriented people? Here's how I'll know. 
If you're five minutes late, it drives you bonkers. How many of you are wicked sinners who need to repent now and you just do not think about time? Uh, five minutes, 15 minutes. That's how, that's how Asia is. That's how South America is. Hey, we're, we're here. We're, we're here to serve. I've been in several places around the world. We'll pick you up at 8 o'clock. It's 1230 and we ain't heard from nobody. <laughs> Eight o'clock. Like I'm ready to be part of the sons of thunder and call down fire to destroy you at this point. <laughs> I operate based on time. Like I don't live based on hours. I live based on seconds. I'm, I'm just a very time oriented person. I want to make the best use of every second. And God laughs because he's outside of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could go through these verses. But what about the infinity of God? He actualizes all of his capacities. God also is incomprehensible. John Calvin put it this way, the infinite cannot contain the finite. God is incomprehensible. We can't fully know God. We could do this every Wednesday night for the next three billion years and still not get to the end of it. But we can know God truly. One theologian was famously asked by a student, very well-known theologian, he said, what is the most profound theological truth you know? After all of his years of study, he replied, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. The simplest of truth blows our mind. Another attribute of God is that God is almighty. So the question that I ask is that can God do anything? Can God do anything is what I asked at the beginning. If you'd been learning your children's catechisms, you would know the answer to that. Can God do anything? Say it loud. I'm giving you 10,000 pieces of candy before you live here, and Christina is going to be excited. God can do all his holy will. God is almighty. Revelation 1 8. Psalm 115 3 says, He sits in heaven and laughs, and he does whatever he pleases. God, another attribute, is most holy. He's weighty. He's perfectly pure. It speaks of his sovereign transcendence, his supreme greatness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. He is thrice holy. And Hebrews 12, 14 says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The confession says that he is most wise. You know what one of my favorite songs is? You know I grew up in Slap Out, so I love country music. Go ahead and judge me. I'll judge your music too. <laughs> Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. You ever had it happen? Boy, you construct your life. You got a plan. You know this is what needs to happen. And then a train wreck crushes every plan you had. God, what are you doing? You need to start listening to me. And it turns out time and time again that he is more wise than we are. And do you ever look back and think, no, I don't thank him for unanswered prayers. He answered it. He just said no. And thank God that he did. Because he always chooses what is best. And he is always true to his own glory and to the good of his people. We're wrapping this up next. God is most free and most absolute, working all things to the counsel of his own will. He is free and sovereign. And he uses means to accomplish his will. Ephesians 1.11 says he works all things after the counsel of his will. God is not under or outside the law. He is law in and of himself and it flows out of him and from who he is. And everything is dependent on him. People like to think that we're free. <laughs> Only God is truly and ultimately free. 
There's a doctrine that has swept through the church for a long time. It's called open theism. Open theism is an assault to God. Open theism basically says that God's plans depend on our plans. God adjusts his plans for our life based on what he foresees that we're going to do. That is nonsense. And he's not random and he's not arbitrary with anything that he does. You say, why did God allow that? Why did God ordain that? I don't know. That can's going to be kicked all the way back to Genesis. Why did God allow sin? Why did God put the tree in the garden knowing that he would take it from them? Why did God, why did God? You know the answer to that, don't you? For the praise of his glory, Ephesians 1 says. We'll find out the rest in heaven. And then he is loving, gracious, merciful, and long-suffering. It refers to God's goodness. He reigns on the just and the unjust. He gives himself freely to others. Again, Sproul says, we find the deepest manifestation of God's grace and love in his forgiveness. Grace is God's love toward those who deserve punishment. We are justified by his grace as a gift, Romans 3, 24. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 speaks of God's mercy and says he is the father of mercies and he is the God of all comfort. God's goodness toward those who are in distress, his pity toward the suffering, that is his mercy. God is long-suffering. It means that his goodness withholds punishment toward those who sin. He is patient. Slow to anger, Psalm 103, verse 8 says. And then finally, the confession says, He is abundant in goodness and truth. He is truth. He is the essence of the true, the good, and the beautiful. The confession says that He forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. You know, I've said this before, but you know... You know what I think the three most powerful words in the entire universe are? I don't think there's three more powerful words that have more impacted people's life than these three words. I forgive you. And that's what God says to his people. I forgive you. Not to hold a debt over your head, but to pay the debt and to, in its place, give you nothing but undeserved grace. Because he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And the confession says what Hebrews eleven six 6 says. He, re- he rewards those who seek him diligently. Seek me and you'll find me. It won't be to no avoid. And the confession says, at the same time, he is perfectly just and terrifying in his judgments because he pours out his wrath on sin. He hates all sin. He hates all evil doers. God, well, you say, well, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. I don't know where you get that from. The Bible says he hates all who do evil. He hates all evil. Workers of iniquity. He hates all sin. And then finally, and will certainly not clear the guilty. He will not clear the guilty. Which means that he will not let a single wrong go unnoticed. And he will right every wrong. I heard the other day about a guy who got falsely accused. Spent 30 years in prison got labeled as an abuser, and he never did it. Can you imagine that? You rot in prison for 30 years, and it turns out you were completely innocent. God's not going to clear the guilty, but you know what he is going to do? He's going to justify him. He is going to legally declare all who look upon his son as righteous, and he is going to give them his righteousness the righteousness of his own son, and he is going to take our sin upon himself. We need to go through all of these attributes together like we have tonight, and here's why. Here's why. 
I almost don't want to use this illustration because I know I've used it before, but maybe some of you haven't used it, and I can't think of a better one. I remember before the church got me a lawnmower, my patience was really being tested, and all of my sanctification was. And I called the guy. I called him, and I said, listen, I'm a preacher, and you're about to make me cuss over this lawnmower because it's driving me crazy, and you got to get this deal fixed. You are driving me nuts because you won't do what you say you're going to do. Well, I get out there one day, and this wasn't the problem, but it was the problem one day, and I w- I'd had it. I was hot. I was mad. Do you ever get like that? No. Liar. And I looked behind me after I had cut a large portion of the yard, and as I looked behind me, I saw 58 strips like this, which meant that on the left side, the grass was not there. It was completely dirt. On the right side, it was as high as it was when I originally touched it. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. You know what we say around our house? It's always something. It's always something. Well, not only do I need to start over, now i got to figure out what happened. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to really, boy, if you admired me before this sermon, you're going to really admire my intelligence now, aren't you? You have the smartest Dr. Scroggins, huh? Got in my own little world. I was thinking about the Sunday sermon. Man, I was just in my own world. Tires were flat on the left side. Didn't realize it. Oh, shut up. You've done stupid stuff too. Come on. This is the big danger I've noticed in the Christian life. That's what happens to Christians' theology. They get flat tire theology. What happens, if we're not careful, is we get so consumed in one attribute of God that we completely neglect the whole counsel of His Word and the fullness of who He is. So let me just give you one example. So in our culture today, God is love, love, love. Ooey gooey. We sing songs to God on Sunday morning with the lights down and sometimes you wonder, are we singing to the Holy One? Are we, are we singing to our girlfriend from seventh grade? Like, it's just weird. Some of the songs that we sing today, some of the stuff I'm like, sounds like a teenage boy in the back seat of a movie theater. Like, I, I don't know who we think we're singing to. God is love, love, love. It's a misunderstanding of love. But what about God's wrath and what about his anger? Is that all that God is? But what happens is we end up fumbling around with Reformed theology and we know enough to realize that we don't really know nothing. We're like a cat that gets a new toy and beats it to death. And then we realize God is anger and he's just. Don't give me that love stuff. You're an immature Christian. God is angry. And it's almost like we have to apologize for God being love. But God is all of these things. He is transcendent above all things, holy, sovereign, and separate, while at the same time extends his hand like an intimate father to a stumbling child to love him and assure him of his grace forever. Do you see the importance of the whole counsel of God in applying each attribute rightly to our lives and perspective? Father, we thank you for who you are. I'm so sorry for how I misrepresent you. We really are trying to do the best we can. And this is big stuff. But we know that we're humbled before you. And we love you. And we admire you. We're in awe of you. And we want to submit to you out of love. So just help us. Be patient with us and help us to continue to not only know about you, but to know you. In Jesus' name. Amen.